Donald Fraser is here. He insisted on waiting to see you. This bottle is for her visitors. Personally, I prefer the sherry. Hastings, it would appear that you are getting slightly thin on top. Really? I hadn't noticed. This man is tired. Donald is short of sleep, and it looks as if he didn't even bother to undress before going to bed. Mr. Paro, I don't know why I'm here. You wanted to talk? And you came to find the only man capable of hearing you. Mr. Paro, since Betty's death, I've doubts about myself. I don't know what to do. And I keep having a horrible dream three nights in a row. Have a drink and tell me about this dream. It's always the same. I'm on the beach with Betty. I grab her round the throat and I squeeze and squeeze until she's dead. Her head falls back and I see that it's no longer Betty. It's Megan's face. Have you seen Megan Barnard recently? Yes, our grief has brought us together. I never really knew her before. She's really quite a remarkable girl. But I would never tell her about my dream. Why not? Is it her you are attacking in your dream? No, it's Betty. And once Betty is dead, it's Megan's face that appears in its place. Very interesting. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Mr. Fraser, I think that the real meaning of this dream is that you are in love with Megan Barnard. Please go on. Do. This dream certainly betrays your guilt. Oh. But what do you feel guilty about? Having killed your fiancé? Possible. Or forgetting her very quickly for her sister? Certainly. And this forgetting is perceived as a second death. So you don't really think I was the one who killed Betty? I do not exclude this theory. I am simply saying that I do not need to know that fact to explain your dream and your guilt. Thank you for being frank, Mr. Poirot. You've helped me a great deal. I'm going back to Bexhill. I'll not take any more of your time up. It is late, Mr. Fraser, and you are tired. I'll sleep on the train. I like trains. It's easy to sleep rocked by the sound of the wheels. Poor boy, he seems completely lost. Well, women seem to like him. I think Megan will take care of him. 
Oh, I remember. Did you order the product I needed? Yes, we'll be receiving it tomorrow. Bien, it is late, and ask Miss Gray to come tomorrow morning. I have a few questions I wish to ask her. Mademoiselle, I asked you here in order to answer a very important question. Am I right in thinking you said that you did not speak to anyone on the day Sir Carmichael was murdered? It's the absolute truth. Yet, Lady Clark maintained that she saw you talking to a stranger on the front doorstep. Really? She must have been mistaken. Oh, I remember now. I'd forgotten all about it, but it wasn't important. It was just a salesman. One of those traders who sell stockings from door to door. Can you describe him to me? Medium size, mm, glasses, dark suit and a felt hat. Not the sort of man you notice, completely harmless. That's why I forgot all about him. Nothing else? He was very hesitant and shy. Usually door-to-door -door salesmen are very confident, but he wasn't. did not leave Cheston willingly, I believe. I don't wish to lie. Lady Clark did not appreciate my presence. And Franklin cannot go against the wishes of a sick lady. He is a good man, and he worries a great deal about his sister-in-law. I noticed that you left some personal belongings behind at Cheston. It was too risky for you to keep these objects, am I correct? Risky? What was the risk? You know very well what Lady Clark might have said if you had kept these objects. Indeed. These objects were gifts. But Lady Clark would have been convinced that I'd stolen them. By returning them, I put an end to such evil gossip. Bien. I must ask you one last question. Please reply frankly with either yes or no. If Lady Clark had died, would you have agreed to marry Sir Carmichael if he'd ask you? How dare you ask such a question? Sir Carmichael treated me just like his daughter. And all that I ever felt him was affection and gratitude, nothing else. Thank you, mademoiselle. I will not keep you any longer. I met Thora Gray on the stairs. Her cheeks were ablaze, and she appeared to be deeply hurt. Poirot, have you offended the poor girl again? Do you have good reasons for accusing her? I accused her of nothing, Hastings. I simply asked her an important question she did not answer. Let us see if we can answer it for her. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. You must know how to read between the lines, Hastings. When Sir Carmichael refers to paternal affection, he is lying to himself. Read this engraving on the brooch. A dark dragon for an angel with glossy hair. These are the words of a lover, not a father. Lady Clark was not wrong. What if Sir Carmichael had fallen in love with his secretary? That doesn't mean that she forced him to do so. 
True, there are extenuating circumstances. She is a penniless orphan. But she is calculating. Just look how she avoided it when asked if she would have married Clark. I see. You think she seduced Sir Carmichael for her own gain, and that now she is doing the same with his brother. Praro, your world is a very dark place. Do not get carried away, mon ami. We have another more important matter to settle. Really? Yes. Would you believe that Miss Grey taught me something new? Let us now try and get our brand cells to work. It's perfectly clear, Hastings, perfectly clear. Indeed, a stalking seller visited Andover, Bexhill and Churston on the day of each murder. We have our suspect. This should be of interest to Jop. Ah, some cool hair. Chief Inspector, we are looking for a stocking salesman. I see you have a suspect? Yes. Contact all the stocking wholesalers who may employ him. Your suspect is a salesman? No, he does not take orders. He sells door to door. Right. The hunt is on. Are you leaving, Mr. Cust? Yes, I'm going to Cheltenham. You shouldn't travel today. You don't look very well. I have to. I... I have engagements. I must respect them. Can you get the post, Hastings? And why don't you go and get it yourself? Très bien. What's going on? I've never known Hastings to be so disagreeable. Daily Blag, August 31, 1935. Moustache at half-mast. Poirot's repeated failure in ABC case. Sometimes small things trouble great men. Hastings, faithful collaborator of the Belgian detective, knows something about it. Three mornings in a row, he confided to us, the cook broke the egg yolks when preparing Poirot's breakfast. This apparently casual event has greatly disturbed my friend, to the point it breaks his concentration and slows his judgment. I also noticed his moustache, of which he is so proud, being duller than usual. Poirot, I assure you, I haven't said any such thing to the journalists. They twist everything. Hmm. Daily Blag, August 31. Sometimes small things try. Three mornings in a row. This apparently casual. Poirot, I assure Hmm. Royal Mathematical and Statistical Society's Bulletin, September the 9th, 1935. The Alphabet Murder, a Methodical Madman. It's highly probable that the Alphabet Murderer will kill again. Could we possibly estimate the number of victims in his next crime? Yes, and it is easy. As soon as we know the ratio of towns, cities and villages whose names begin with a D and the ratio of English people whose names are spelled the same. On the one hand, the ratio of towns, cities and villages in England with a name starting with D and on the other hand, the ratio of English people with a name also starting with D. 
After this initial calculation, it is easy to deduce the likelihood of actually being murdered if you belong to the target population. Go to the last page to find our results and details on the calculations. Poor Mr. Poirot, I'm quite sorry for you. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. We've a long way to go still. Typerie? No, that comes later. Letter T, the next little incident will take place in Doncaster on September 11th. So long, ABC. I should compare this letter with the one on my desk which I received earlier to see if it does indeed come from the same person. Let us examine this more closely. Certain characters in the two letters may have similar defects. Yes, this I is weird. Right, let us compare this with the other letter. Yes. The I characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. I have to find some other similar defects to confirm my theory. Hmm, the W is not printed properly. Right, let us compare this with the other letter. Of course, the W characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. I have to find some other similar defects to confirm my theory. Yes, the A appears to be quite unusual. Right, let us compare this with the other letter. That's right. The A characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. My theory was right. These two letters were written with the same typewriter. Hastings, he strikes tomorrow. Chief Inspector Jap? He's on another line. Can I take a message? Yes, please, mademoiselle. It is from Hercule Poirot. Tell him ABC strikes tomorrow in Doncaster. You must call me back. Very well, sir. Bien, now I'm going to see what I can find from these burnt documents. I've received the product I need. Hastings, if you do not mind, I would like you to take a few notes. Yes, yes. Down to work. All of this needs putting in order a little.
It's so simple. I think that this is right. This page is finished. That's done. Three more to go. I think that... This page is child's play. This page is finished. And that's two done. I think that this is right. This page is finished. Only one more. Keep going. This page will be reconstructed in a flash. This page is finished. All the pages are reconstructed. The cloth is now soaked with solvent. Got it! Make a note, Hastings, make a note! Mrs. Ali Sasha, Sharpona in Andover. Tracheitis, hemoptysis, prescribed laudanum. I got it! Look! Poirot, where on earth did you find these files? On a fire at the bottom of the garden at Comside. All right, but where did the person who burned them find them? Alice Asher, shopkeeper in Hendover. Tracheitis, hemoptysis, chronic cough with loss of blood. Prescribed laudanum based cough medicine. Betty Barnard, waitress in Bexhill. Chronic bronchitis causing dysphonia. Advised to stop smoking. Alexander Bonaparte Cast, while wounded. Mustard gas and head trauma, pulmonary emphysema, hemoptysis, coughing fits with blood, suffers from absences and amnesia. Dick Dudley Dunbar, owner of the Black Swan Hotel in Doncaster, asthmatic, heart disease, heart condition. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. The burned documents are medical records and without a doubt they come from Clark's archives. First of all, because all the patients have thought conditions. And secondly, their name starts with either A, B, C or D and it is precisely the files that match these letters that have been tampered with. 
But why burn these files? How come the names of the two victims appear on them? And who are the two other patients? These are very good questions. Hello, Poirot. Any news, Chief Inspector? You wanted a stocking seller? We have one. Reported by his landlady, who thought he was behaving suspiciously. He has the most unbelievable name. Alexander Bonaparte Cust. Yes, Alexander Bonaparte Cust. How did you guess? Poirot, you have magical powers. It's a serious lead. I called Doncaster. A person matching Cust's description has been seen at the station. He got off the train from London, but after that, nobody knows where he went. Look for him at the Black Swan Hotel. What? How do you know he's there? Trust me, Chief Inspector. You appear to be very sure of yourself. Very well. I'll call the Black Swan straight away. The owner is going to get a shock when he learns that there's a murderer under his roof. Chief Inspector, I would rather call myself. As you wish. Please go ahead. Hello, the Black Swan. Hercule Poirot here. May I speak to the owner? Speaking. Dick Dudley Dunbar. How can I help you? Is there Mr. Cust among your guests? He arrived today. Shall I call him for you? No, it is you I wish to speak with. But who is this Cust? Have you heard about the ABC case? Oh, yes. I must say I'm not all that reassured. What with my name starting with D and all that? You're in danger. Beware of your guest. Do you think that Cust might be dangerous? Oh, I do hope you're wrong. It seems so harmless, you know. Oh, yes, completely harmless. We must not overestimate the danger. After all, we are not absolutely sure he is guilty. What should I do? Watch him. If he leaves the hotel, watch where he is heading. I'll call the police in Doncaster immediately. When they arrive, keep out of the way. Oh, indeed. I shall keep out of the way. I have a bad heart, you see, and a big shot could kill me. Thank you for having warned me. Hello, Poirot. We have some good news. The police in Doncaster have caught our man at the Black Swan Hotel. They're sending him here by train. While we're waiting to question Cust, we could search his room in London. Where does he live? The Marbury Guest House. I'll see you there. Yes, but start without me. First of all, I have to sort out a few details for Cust's transfer. I understand. A bientôt. Hastings, we are making good progress. Please go and search the room of our number one suspect. With pleasure. I did have a dentist appointment, but I'll cancel. The dentist? So that is why you are so nervous and bad-tempered. A visit to the dentist is never an enjoyable prospect. But an unavoidable one. Go to your appointment, Hastings. I will manage on my own. To Marbury Guest House, please. Marbury. There is a very pretty village by this name in Cheshire. I've been going past this modest guest house for so long. I would never have thought that the ABC case would lead me here. Looks like I've found the real master of this house.
There is no need to worry about the household cat. I'm sure that Mrs. Marbury lets it do what it pleases. How do you do? You must be Mr. Elkil Praro. Chief Inspector Chap told me that you might be coming. Madame, you may be of valuable help to me. It would be my pleasure to help you. Will there be some journalists there as well? I think you might even be interviewed. You are key witness. I've suspected him for some time, but he appeared so harmless. Oh yes, sometimes he got angry and waved his arms about. But even then, he wasn't frightening. And he was as gentle as a lamb again immediately afterwards. It was only this morning that I understood. He told me he was going to Cheltenham, but my daughter saw him at Euston Station. It's not the right station. To get to Cheltenham, you have to take the train from Paddington. And what's more, Mr. Cuss left behind an ABC with Doncaster underlined. As you can imagine, when I saw that, I called Scotland Yard. Well done. You were right. He did go to Doncaster. So I was right to warn the police. Uh, tell me, did you have any other reason to suspect Mr. Cust? Well, he's odd. Sometimes he coughs really loudly and complains that his throat is burning, and sometimes he talks to himself and stares into space. He told me that it was because of a wound he got in the war. His head hasn't been quite right since, he said. And then he was in Churston when that millionaire got murdered. I found his train ticket when I washed his coat. He didn't want me to wash his shirt. He washed it himself. But I did see big brown stains on it. Where were the stains on the shirt? On the collar and on the buttonholes. Cut used to travel for his work. Is that correct? Oh, it wasn't for pleasure. He was always on well on trains. But he had to sell his stockings around England. I have to respect my engagements, he used to say. Do you know where Kirst was at the time of the murder in Andover and Bexhill? On June the 21st and July the 25th? No, I don't know. That was a while ago, you know. But surely you keep a register. It won't do you much good. Mr. Kuss rents his room for the year. If he goes away for a few days, I have no reason to make a note of it. Ah! I remember one thing. Bexhill's by the sea, right? Indeed. It is a large seaside resort. Well, as it happens, at the start of July, Mr. Cast asked me to repair his bathing dress. Suspicious, huh? Very interesting. Please continue. I also forgot to say that he started buying newspapers that talked about the case. When did he start buying the newspapers? Let's see. I think it was just after the millionaire's murder in Churston. He didn't seem all that interested before that. That will be all for now. I'm going to take a look at his room. Take the key on the counter. This woman appears to be in a good mood. Mrs. Marbury is in a good mood. She is working very precisely in producing incredibly thin peel. I don't think my register will help you. Mr. Cuss rents his room all year. If he goes away for a few days, I have no reason to make a note of it. The truth is becoming apparent, and I have something to say to Mrs. Marbury. I have something to say to Mrs. Marbury.
I have something to say to Mrs. Marbury. Mrs. Marbury, if I am to believe the register, you rented room 306 to a certain Mr. Fishman on the day of the Bexil murder? Room 306 is Cuff's room. Can you explain yourself? Yes, I remember. Just for one night as a favor, Mr. Cust was away, all my other rooms were taken, and poor Mr. Fishman had nowhere to go. It doesn't matter, provided that you remembered to change the sheets. Oh, do you think so? Laudanum Cameron's Chemists. Laudanum, a medicine for coughs. It is what Dr. Clark prescribed for Mrs. Asher. This subject will probably be useful to me. Diethyl Barbituric Acid, Johnson Company. I know this medicine. It is a powerful sedative. This subject will probably be useful to me. This dark stain. It could be blood, but goodness knows how long it has been there. Trousers, white shirts, everything has been washed very well. The Bexhill Daily Paper, dated from the day of the Bexhill murder. Most probably the bathing dress repaired by Mrs. Marbury's expert hands. All the main articles referring to the ABC case are here, from the Churston murder onwards. Nothing before that date. How oh, hopeful. This place is a real mess. The least we can say that Mr. Cust is not very concerned about order and balance. War of 1914-1918. By the King's order, the name of Corporal A.B. Cust, Devonshire Regiment, was published on the London Gazette on May the 10th, 1918, as mentioned in the Dispatch for Gallant and Distinguished Service. An army dispatch, wounded on the Somme front, victim of a gas attack. Corporate cost greatly deserves his distinction. ABC guys, enough to sign about a dozen murders. It's closed. A long bladed knife, a murderer's weapon. This subject would probably be useful to me. John Milligan, 
Managing Director, Silky Legs, Frederick Street, Leicester. To A.B. Cust, Marbury's Guest House, 1935, May the 21st. Dear Sir, Further to our letters dated 5th and 10th of the month, we confirm we are you as door-to-door -door salesmen, according to the conditions stated in our previous letters. We would send you the articles by mail and also a Redfield typewriter you would be using for every business letter. Regarding the schedule of your rounds, please do as following. June 21, Andover. Arrive by train the 20th in the evening and get a room at Station Hotel. Start your turn in the north part of the town. This letter establishes that Cust went to Andover, but the ink has hidden the destinations of his other trips. <sighs> I know from Mrs. Marbury that he went to Churston. I just have to show that he went to Bexhill and I will have proved that he was present at all the crime scenes. Did Cust drop it when he opened the window? Or was it Mrs. Marbury while she was cleaning? Cast is parsimonious. He keeps his pencils and sharpens them until there is nothing left. It is clear that he did not grow up in luxury. It's an ABC. I have to get the ribbon. How am I going to do it? The left hand heel has been removed. The right hand heel has been removed. And here is the ribbon. Let us see if it was indeed used to write the letters sent by ABC. I only need the ink ribbon for my inquiry. I will let Jack clean the keyboard if he wishes. All the letters announcing the murders were written on Cust's typewriter. This knife is very useful. Who knows, maybe it never cut anything other than string. Stockings. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. The register shows that Cust did not sleep at the guest house on the day of the murder. Where was he? Bexhill. The Bexhill paper reveals it. Cust bought this newspaper in Bexhill on July the 25th. No use continuing the inspection of this room. I've seen all there is to see. Goodbye, Mrs. Marbury. Thank you for your help. Bye. Ah, Chief Inspector. I was about to leave. Good evening, Chief Inspector. Welcome. Please excuse me. I must go to the kitchen. I'll leave the queue of Mr. Cust on the counter. I'm sorry I'm late. I've spent ages with the Doncaster police. And you? I have established one fact. On three occasions... Cust was at the scene on the day of the crimes. I've listened closely to what you have to say, Poirot. For me, there's no doubt Cust is guilty. Do you have any element that might prove the contrary? That is what we're going to look for. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work.
the evidence against Cust is overwhelming. His presence at the scenes, the knife, the blood-stained shirt, the ABCs in a box. C'est vrai. However, the blood Mrs. Marbury saw on Cust's shirt may have been his own. According to his medical records, he suffers from hemoptysis. The murderer cut Sir Carmichael's throat from behind and the blood spurted outwards. You would expect the murderer's shirt to be stained on the sleeves, not on the buttonholes, yet we see quite the opposite. You would expect the murderer to keep the newspaper articles about his crimes. But Cust's collection starts in Cheston, as if it discovered the case rather late. Hmm, I agree it's troubling, but it doesn't change my mind. There's small details that we should be able to clear up by questioning Cust. When can we talk to him? Doncaster is sending him to us on the first train. Are they questioning him already? He says he can't remember a thing. It's plausible. Doctor say he suffers from absences and amnesia. Mrs. Marbury has confirmed this. He may have done the murders in an altered state. A familiar situation. It's not enough to clear his name. Dr. Thompson insisted that even if you don't know what you're doing, you never commit a murder without wanting to. Très intéressant. I shall remember that. Right. I'll go and examine the suspect's room. Chief Inspector, I took the liberty of removing a few clues to examine at home. All right. We'll discuss them tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm going to see if you've missed something. To Scotland Yard, please. This man is not in good shape. He is worried and very tired, and other police have been hard on him. What do you want from me? Good day, Mr. Cust. I am Hercule Poirot. Ah, you're the detective. Yes, I am the person you have been sending the letters to. I didn't write these letters. I've already said so. Très bien. You did not hide these letters. But the question remains, who did? Probably one of my enemies. I have many. Are you capable of murder, Mr. Cust? All these questions are giving me a headache. <sighs> You suffered during the war. It's true. I was wounded. I suffered. But... The army was the only place I didn't feel inferior. No questions. Just orders to follow. But ever since you were wounded, you have absences, bouts of amnesia. And headaches. <sighs> Professor Clark treated you. Yes, a few years ago, he really helped me with my burned throat. And to thank him, you murdered him? 
Stop talking about these murders. Of course, you never considered killing a doctor who took such good care of you. No, no, never. Do you deny being at the scene of the crimes? So? There was no harm in being there. It was only for my work. You were seen at all the crime scenes. Yes, I was. I travel a lot. But not for pleasure. I am terribly unwell in trains. But I had to respect my engagements. My employer gave me very precise written instructions about the towns I had to visit. <coughs> Let's see. The company you claim to work for, Silky Legs, has never heard of you. And as for these letters they sent you, they were written on your own typewriter. The company sent me the typewriter when I started working for them. Yes, but the letters were received afterwards. So it would appear that you typed them before sending them to yourself. I... I don't remember. Good God! I don't know what's happening to me. My head hurts terribly. Take this. It will help you. <coughs> oh, I think I'll be fine. Let us see, Cust. Look at me. You know very well that you committed these murders? Yes, I know. But I'm not wrong in saying that you do not know why you committed them. No, I don't. And what conclusions have you drawn? Plenty. It might help us to understand him a little better. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. I don't see any clearer than before. This is worse. There is one point to highlight. C'est curieux. Cust admits that he killed, but he does not know why. What did Dr. Thompson say? Even if Cust killed while in an altered state, it still must have been his deepest desire. He must have had a motive. Let's keep it simple. Never mind his motive. He confessed. But you see, he can confess to anything and everything. He denied the murders and then he confessed to them. He confirmed that he never typed the letters. Then, with great ease, I managed to get him to say quite the opposite. Come on, he behaved like a guilty man. He lied to his landlady. Because deep down he believes himself guilty. 
From the papers, he noticed that he had always been at the scene of the crimes. He must think that he killed and then simply forgot what he had done. How can you be so sure? Let us look at his psychological profile. You will understand my point of view. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. You see? Cus's character is quite the opposite of the murderers. But if he's a madman, can we really talk about his character? You know very well that our murderer does not behave like a psychopath. Apart from the signature, there is no ritual repetition in the choice of victims. Very well, very well. You're right, as always. So, we have no confession, no culprit, no suspects, nothing. And all that after two months of inquiry? What should I do? Have faith. Just give me 24 hours. To White Heaven, please. Cust's arrest is a great success, Fuparo. It's all clear now, except maybe one or two details. Details? Ah, mon ami. The devil is in the detail, as we say. Excuse me? Patience, Hastings. Everything will be clear once I guest arrive. Best be prepared. Slip a revolver into your pocket before they do. A revolver? But Poirot, what are you afraid of? Trust me. It is important you carry a weapon for this meeting. I will lend you mine. What about telling me what you have in mind? Surtout pas. You wouldn't be able to play your role. Wait one moment, I will bring you my weapon. Daily Flicker, September the 11th, 1935. ABC Affair, Terminus Doncaster, Jap and Poirot arrest the killer. A.B. Cust is the name of the alphabet murderer. The police have arrested him in a hotel in Doncaster. He was preparing to kill his fourth victim, Mr. Dick Dudley Donbar, the establishment manager. Mr. Donbar owes his life to the miraculous intervention of Inspector Chap of Scotland Yard and Detective Hercule Poirot. The Lancet, September 11th, 1935. General Medical Journal. The alphabet murderer is not psychotic, according to Professor Thompson. In an early issue, we claim that the alphabet murderer was not psychotic. Our assertion has just been confirmed by Professor Thompson, a Scotland Yard expert, who has spoken to the prisoner at great length. Not all obsessional killers are psychotic, he explained. It is true that Kirst has a disturbed personality and memory disorders. But his amnesia, whether real or pretended, does not alter the fact that he was perfectly lucid at the time of his acts. Therefore, he will not escape punishment.
white ammunition are blank cartridges. The others are real bullets. I have to choose the type of bullets to load. The revolver is loaded with blanks. I still have time to choose real bullets. The revolver is loaded with real bullets. I still have time to choose blanks. Are blank cartridges. The others are real bullets. The revolver is loaded with blanks. I still have time to choose real bullets. Voila! I don't trust you with my weapon. It has hardly been used. It is almost new. Chief Inspector, is that you? Yes. Sorry, but we haven't found anything. Have you checked the typewriter? And the packaging, the letter, and the ribbon reel. We've only found prints left by Cust and his landlady. Well, never mind. I shall make do. So, are you still going to hold your meeting? Of course, Chief Inspector. I can hear my guest coming up the stairs. Why have you brought us here, Mr. Poirot? Since Cust arrest, I thought it was all done and dusted. Miss Gray formally identified him, as well as Miss Barnard. Yes, and the stockings he saw drove the same brand as the ones found at my aunt's. This is all true. However, a case is not closed if some questions remain open. And one question is, why did the murderer send me his letters? Why did he challenge me, Hercule Poirot? Perhaps he wanted to play with you, to taunt you. Xenophobia? Maybe he didn't like you because you're foreign. Um, I may be wrong, but maybe by provoking you, he was looking for glory. All these theories should be studied. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Is everything clear now? Hmm, you might like to explain your reasoning again. Of course. First of all, remember that the murderer made it a rule to always post his letter before the murder. He never digressed from that rule. However, in Cheston, he encountered a problem. The village has only 500 inhabitants. With advance warning, it would be easy to arrest him. Therefore, the murderer delayed his letters deliberately with the wrong address. The plan wouldn't have worked if he'd sent it to Scotland Yard or the papers because everybody knows their addresses. The mistake would have been corrected and the letter would have been on time. That is why the murderer chose me as the recipient. Because for his plan to succeed, it was necessary for at least one of the letters to have a wrong address and get lost. It was very cunning. Absolutely. It is a very subtle plan. It matches the profile we have drawn up of him perfectly. That of an intelligent, daring and calculating murderer. But that's not how you describe Cust. You are quite right, mademoiselle. Like you, I find it hard to believe that this dull character is the clever murderer we are looking for. Do madmen... I mean, if he's mad, he might have two very different sides. No doubt. But the murderer is not mad. All the specialists agree that he does not have the profile of a psychopath. But if Cust is not guilty, how do you explain his presence at the scene of the crimes? Mr. Clark, the answer to your question is in the medical records of your brother's patients. Documents which Cust most certainly did not have access to. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work.
Dr. Clark's patient's records provided a very useful list of potential victims, sorted by alphabetical order. The killer definitely used it, explaining the fact that all the victims were former patients of the doctor. It is this fact that clears cast once and for all, because he never had access to these records. So how did he happen to be at the scene of the crimes? Either the murderer sent him there, or Cus was following him closely. Cus's highly suggestible nature leads us to the second hypothesis. The murderer was manipulating him. He systematically sent Cus to the towns where he was going to strike, so that the suspicion would land on the poor man's shoulder. That's evil! What sort of killer could have such a plan? And what would he gain from three completely different murders? Indeed, it seems unlikely that the same murderer committed all the crimes. What should we take from that? Just one murder was of benefit to the murderer. The others were just diversions. On reflection, there is only one conclusion. The murderer killed once out of interest and twice to divert our attention. This reasoning points at two potential culprits. Franklin Clark... Donald Fraser? Yes, mademoiselle. That's good thinking. Mr. Fraser may have killed Betty out of jealousy. Mr. Clark may have killed his brother in order to inherit his large fortune. Both have a motive. But Donald did not have access to Dr. Clark's records. Please allow me to disagree with you, mademoiselle. He works for Court and Brunskill, one of whose clients was Sir Carmichael. It doesn't prove that I went to Combside. You could have done it. And you may have used the opportunity to take a look at Sir Carmichael's record. Do you think I'm guilty? You? Or Mr. Franklin Clark? That's ridiculous! Both of you have a motive. The question is, which of you has the profile that most resembles the murderer? Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald may share many character traits with the murderer, but he does not have his cold indifference. He has a temper. It is hard to imagine him planning anything. Also, jealousy is his motive, and crimes of passion are rarely planned. Right, I suppose it's my turn to be subjected to the same scrutiny. Absolument, Mr. Clark. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. As you have all seen, there is a disturbing similarity between Mr. Clark's profile and that of the killer. In actual fact, it is exactly the same. Mr. Poirot, your psychological studies are interesting, but your conclusions do not add up. Why would I have wished my brother's death? The inheritance is lawfully mine. I just have to wait. No, you had to act quickly. Because of Miss Gray. Mademoiselle, although you haven't been telling the truth, 
There is no doubt in my mind that you would have found a way to marry Sir Carmichael after Lady Clark's death. For you, Mr. Clark, it was a disaster. If Miss Grey had children by your brother, you would not have inherited a thing. You realize the danger after reading several letters from Comside, especially one in which your brother opened his heart to you. So you hurried home from China, and you took action. In truth, Kirst was no more than a puppet manipulated by the real culprit. You, Mr. Clark. Such an imagination, Mr. Poirot. In fact, nobody manipulated Kirst. The famous instructions he received by post. He wrote them on the typewriter. We know that for sure. Oh, no. You know perfectly well. That is not true. Eh bien, voilà. Light has now been shed on the ABC murders. Your theories are ingenious, but you haven't any proof. One point to him. For the moment, I have no material proof. Either I admit to it, or I bluff. One thing proves it. The prince you left on Cus typewriter. Enough. Oh, of course you wiped the typewriter before sending it. But not carefully enough. Scotland Yard has found your print along with those of Cust. I understand why you never wanted to lend me your new typewriter. And why you were searching through your brother's things. And the hole you dug on the moors. What did you hide there? The knife you used to kill your brother? Game, set, match. You win, Mr. Poirot. But it was worth trying. Don't come near me! I'll never let you take me, Mr. Poirot! I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. There is no easy death for you. I expected your reaction, so I used blanks. I'm sorry, mademoiselle, but your second chance has been lost. Franklin Clark will never inherit his brother's fortune. Disappointed at having missed the chance to become Lady Clark, Thora Gray left England. Donald Fraser and Megan Barnard married. On Poirot's recommendation, Mary Drower started to work for Lady Clark. The elderly lady's condition suddenly took a turn for the better. And a few months later, to Dr. Logan's great surprise, she was back on her feet again. According to this eminent physician, it appears to be an extremely rare case of spontaneous remission. Lady Clark has enjoyed very good health ever since. Journal of an Innocent. The incredible story of ABC. As for A.B. Cust, after being advised by Poirot, he made a great deal of money by selling his story to the press. And as for me, and with business booming, the Black Swan has become the number one tourist attraction in the whole of Yorkshire, even more popular than York Minster.